Hi, I'm Media Chukriani from Bill James. I'd like to invite you to think about the earliest memory you can think of. What is it? Maybe you're watching a parent cook you a tasty meal. Maybe you're playing with sibling. Or maybe you're getting ready for school. What do all of these have in common? They are all located in a house. Housing is fundamental. It shapes our life from the earliest days to our last. I want to thank you for tuning in today to the section Breaking the Vicious Cycle of Disasters How Preventing Housing Collapse Can Reshape Risk Reduction. And thank you also to the GPDR organizer for helping us draw attention to these important issues. By 2030, it is estimated that 3 billion people will be living in vulnerable housing. This is about 40% of the world's population. In our field, we often talk about the qualitative housing deficit, which means the amount of quality resilient housing available. And that deficit is increasing. Hazards such as windstorms, wildfires, or floods are increasing in frequency and severity. And additional climate impacts such as extreme heat and sea level rise are making it worse. Yet, housing loss is often addressed after the fact. For example, when Hurricane Maria struck the small island nation of Dominica, over 90% of its housing stock was damaged. This country is barely have enough time to rebuild before another storm or earthquake strike. So instead of bail chains, we advocate for prevention-based approaches. Hazards do not need to be disasters. If we build better now, we can prevent loss of housing and loss of life. Since 2004, new chains have been changing system for resident housing worldwide. And today, we have strengthened over 100,000 houses and made over 500,000 people more resilient to the impacts of disasters. So we work with governments, technologies, builders, architects, engineers, philanthropists, and most importantly, homeowners to improve homes before the next disaster strikes. In our work, we've identified three key factors for addressing resilient housing, people, money, and technology. People drive the demand for resilient housing. Who wants resilient housing? How do we shape the policy for ensuring that this demand can be met? Money, on the other hand, represents the financing for resilient housing. How do we bridge the gap between supply and demand and drive the investment and financing mechanism for those who need it the most? And lastly, technology is the supply of resilient housing. How do we use the best engineering expertise to ensure that housing is safe and sustainable? How do we automate and strengthen efficiency for scaling? I'm going to give you some insight on how we're approaching this issue to advance prevention effort. There are several examples of how policy can be shaped to prioritize housing loss prevention. So given that the GPDR is being hosted by Indonesia, I'll focus on the case of how Indonesia has made progress. To address the substandard existing housing stock, the Indonesian government has started to implement a subsidy program for house improvement and incremental constructions through the Bantuan Stimulan Rumah Swadaya or BSPS. The program since 2006 which is managed by the Ministry of Public Works and Housing, aims to enable lower middle income and low income households to do self-help improvements to their homes. 
in just between two, 2010 until 2013, the program has impacted over 500,000 households with only 1,500 US dollar cost per unit on average. Through the evaluation that Bill Chen's conducted in 2019, together with the Ministry of Housing and the World Bank, we identify impacts and opportunities to strengthen the delivery and reach of the program to align better with the disaster risk reduction agenda. This effort contributed to the improved quality-based subsidy approaches in subsidy allocation that will enable homeowners to meet the safety adequacy requirement to withstand earthquakes and other hazards. In the financing space, we work closely with governments and financial institutions to both create and implement subsidy and grant programs. We also develop form products for microfinance clients to incrementally make home improvements. But I want to draw your attention to what those resources mean for local communities and highlight three key findings that we just recently uncovered as part of our new publication, The Cost of Improving Vulnerable Housing. So we analyzed data from Bill Chen's work from nearly 1,500 design across countries. First, structurally strengthening a home costs an average 23% of new construction in the same location. This means that funds you saw at repair can go so much further if we were to break the cycle of destruction and reconstruction. Similarly, it is important to consider the economic supply and demand in post disaster reconstruction. We found that compared with prevention interventions, after a disaster, construction costs for home improvement were 1.6 times higher due to the challenges such as difficulty in transporting materials and inflation. And I think it's important to note that when we talk about prevention, we can take two steps as part of recovery process. As homeowners are rebuilding and repairing their homes after disaster, we found that an additional investment of only 30% can ensure that the whole home is resilient against future threats. There is a critical need for technology for good, and we advocate for technology for prevention. Indonesia is growing faster than in other Asian countries. By 2025, nearly 70% of Indonesia's population will live in cities. This growth will put pressure on cities to provide houses. The use of digital technology then, it's so critical for scaling and for supporting rapid progress in reducing disaster risks. Buchins advocates for the widespread adoptions of digital technology where relevant and feasible and supports government and implementers to incorporate it into the existing workforce. The government of Indonesia, for instance, has developed an innovative model application called Inaris to empower the communities to make a better informed decisions. This is an example of how digital technology could continue to transform the scope of what is possible for resilient housing and resilient communities. Buchins has also developed mobile applications following the 2015 earthquake in Nepal and the 2018 earthquake in Palu. It aims to help individual homeowners who want to rebuild their homes to get access to various home design options and retrofit options that are safe based on their individual preferences and guidelines on how to build them properly. So appropriate use of digital technology can vastly improve compliance, efficiency, and accountability and broaden the scope of what is possible across the construction value chain. We advocate first and foremost for a whole society approaches by giving you insight into what can be done across policy, financing, and technology, 
I want to stress that there is a role for each one of us participating in the GPDRR to strengthen prevention. So whether you work for the local or national government in your country, or are engaged in the financing, race, or insurance sectors, or if you're a scientist, researcher, or architect, we can all come together to build a resilient future. We hope you'll join us. Let's go be and build back better. Let's build better now. Thank you.